Well, good morning, crowd, <laughs> Facebook family, friends, those that are on the Instagram, those that will be on YouTube a little bit later, and uh, the scattered few that are here, which is less than five. So uh, we're, we're excited that you're here. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and worshiping with us. Uh, it's a great excitement in the air. You can feel people starting to get back to normal a little bit. Uh, but we're going to play it safe for a week or so, and, and we'll let you know whenever we come back together. But right now, this is the day the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice in it, and we are so excited that you are joining us live. And we want you to have a great experience with God, and we want you to just feel connected. We're going to sing a couple worship songs, so here's what I want you to do. Participation is key. Participation is key. Sing at home. Sing out loud. Sing praises. Raise your hand. Get into worship. Get into the scripture. Get into the word. And let's let God speak to us today in a unique, mighty way. And we will just praise him in the middle of circumstances. So let's have a great time as we worship.
What a great way to get started. And thank you so much for coming in here today and, and worshiping with us. We're so excited about today and about what we are going to do. And we're going to start something called One Degree. If you've been around me long enough, you know that One Degree can change the entire trajectory of your life. It can change the way you're doing things. And we can change the way that we see things versus the way that God sees things. And it's really kind of a cool thing. So if you're joining us today online, we love you guys. We can't wait to get together and worship and share and go. We can't wait to just be together in a worship setting. But for right now, this is what we do. This is where we are. So quick question. <clears throat> do you ever look at the lives of other people? and ask the question, they got it more together than I do. How did that happen? How did they get everything together? And <clears throat> what does that mean for me? Because I, I sometimes look at other pastors, if you will, and I go, wow, they really got their act together. They've got things going together. And we look at other people and other Christians and we just go, wow, they're so much better than I am in this area of my life. And I don't even know what big things I need to do to get those results. What big master thing that I have to conquer in order to get uh, all of these things to go the way that I want them. I've got no idea all the big changes that I would have to make in order for me to be that type of a person. And so <clears throat> I want to bring some good news to you today if you've ever felt that way. Because I really believe um, that it's not the big changes we need to make because I, I've got one idea for you today and I want to share something with you today that, that really kind of put it all into perspective. I've really been wrestling with this all week um, <clears throat> because it's something that's important to me and I think it's important to you. And here's the big idea that we're going to get at today and the big thought process. And so I want you to start thinking about this. And here we go. Here it is. The number one thing. It's the small things that no one sees that result into the big things that everyone wants. It's the small things that no one sees that result into the big things that everyone wants. If you've been with me for any time, you know I call it one degree. You don't need to change everything. You just need to lay down just one degree. And if I can change one degree right here, my trajectory out there is going to be six feet different. If I can change it just one millimeter, if I can change it just one centimeter, if I can change it just a little bit, if you lay the block on a foundation and if you lay it in just one way, it'll either be straight or it'll be off. And so you've got to get that one degree. And so let me give you an example. I've got a friend of mine that uh, I really admired the way he walked with God. And I really admired his, his life. And, um, and, and I don't know if you've ever known anyone like that. Uh, he was very powerful uh, prayer. He was very encouraging in his words. And um, uh, when, when people would, would come to him, he could automatically just quote scripture, would just pop into his mind. It would be so appropriate. And you can just really sense this guy was being led by the spirit and everything that he did. And I asked him one time, I said, man, what is your secret? Uh, what are the big things that you did to get these results? I mean, uh, people come to you and you have this vast knowledge and, and you have this, this understanding of the scripture and you have this grasp on things. What is it that you did? I mean, it's got to be something big. And here's what he said. Honestly, things changed for me about 17 years ago. Now, this was a few years ago. So he said about 17 years ago. When I started reading through the Bible every year, just each year I'd read from cover to cover and go through the Bible. And that really helped me be grounded in, in the things of God. And I was like, well, of course, reading the Bible uh, for 17 years, uh, it's a big thing, you know, cover to cover 17 years in a row. Um, I, I think that would be, you know, if you could do that. He goes, no, that's not the point. The point is I didn't look at reading it all year long. I looked at 15 minutes a day. I broke it down to 15 minutes a day. And I just made sure that my 15 minutes a day of my scripture reading, not the prayer time or not the journaling or not any of that, the 15 minutes of the scripture reading was not just reading a book, but literally understanding what this is. So I'm telling you, in some of the small things that we do can make huge changes and results that everybody's going to want. 15 minutes of discipline 
changed this guy's life. 15 minutes of discipline. And I, and I just want to share with you that, that we can all have one thing, one change, one degree, and our trajectory of life will be completely changed. And six months from now, you're going to look back and people are going to look at you and go, you used to, but now you are. What changed? What is this big thing, this big transformation? And we're going to look at them and go, it wasn't a big thing. It was a little thing that I did that God did in me. So we're going to look at Zechariah chapter four. And uh, I, I want you to, to kind of look at Zechariah chapter four. By the way, I'm going to share this with you. Um, some of my colleagues, we were talking and I think we're all going to say it today. Don't get lazy in your Bible. Just because we put it up on the screen doesn't mean you shouldn't bring it to church or you shouldn't open it in your lap or you shouldn't have it with you at any time. Here's what I want to encourage my Bible study tomorrow night. In fact, if you want to join me on this Bible study journey for tomorrow night, it's basic. I'm going to let them know and I'm going to give you a heads up. If you don't know what to memorize, here's what you do. Memorize the books of the Bible. It'd be a whole lot easier to memorize the books of the Bible. So when I say Zechariah, you go, I know where that is. And you don't have to look at the index. <laughs> that's okay if you have an index. But that's one thing that you want to do. So don't get lazy. Follow along. Underline. Look at it. Read it. And it's really good. So I'm going I'm to break it down in a very specific, direct way and focus on some small things. And, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that we're going to do. And then I want to share with you some of the ways that this series is going to go. Obviously, next week is Mother's Day, so we're going to go one thing for moms that can make you a better person. I'm not going to ask you to make a better mom because I have no idea how to make a better mom because I'm not a mom. But I'm going to tell you that there's one thing that we can do to make ourselves better. So I'm going to break it down. So let me give you a little context. Zechariah chapter 4. During the time when this was written, the temple was destroyed and God's people were in captivity. And so it was a very low point in biblical history, if you will. We don't have a house for God and we're not even in a place that we're supposed to be. So they were very depressed. And the year was 537 BC. Zerubbabel led a, a, a small group of people back to Israel. And so there became a little bit of hope. And so we're back in the land where they're supposed to live. And then 18 years later, God spoke to King Zerubbabel. And he said, I'm going to give you the power to rebuild the temple. So we're going to rebuild this place and, and it's all going to come together. So I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, Zechariah chapter 4. And we're going to read it. And we're going to let this scripture kind of speak to us. People have asked me before, how do you just read this scripture and you get so much out of it? And it's easy whenever you let the scripture speak to you. Rather than you speak to the scripture and say, get behind me because I'm in a hurry. <laughs> but you meditate on the word. So here we go. Second Kings, or Zechariah, Second Kings. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, New Living Translation. Here's what it says. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength. In other words, stop right there, just a minute. It's not by force nor by, uh, force nor by strength. In other words, the temple is not going to be built in a way that you get credit for it. It's not going to be built in the way that people are going to look at you and say, this is the hand of so-and-so. But by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, here's the thing. You can try to change and you can try to do things in your own power and you can make some very small improvements by your power, but if you'll tap into a power greater than which you possess, if you tap into the power of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit is made perfect in our weaknesses. And so we have to try to do some things and we, we kind of get this idea that if I just do, but the truth of the matter is, God is working through us and He tells us this is the direction I need you to go. So it's not by our effort, not by our might, not by our power, but His Spirit, He can transform you. Now, let me share something with you. I'm going to be a very uh, transparent person today. I was trying to fix some plumbing in the house a few years ago. And uh, if you know me, uh, <clears throat> plumbing and, and Lonnie don't go together. Um, I usually end up with a bigger problem than when I started. So uh, being the guy, I can fix anything. So I tried to fix, and I spent the majority of the day 
um, trying to fix some stuff. And uh, puddles were everywhere. And a friend of mine came over uh, with his little tool bag. I'm not sure how that happened, uh, Donna Lee Case Grant. But I'm pretty sure that uh, there was a phone call and there was a something happened. And what took me most of the day, uh, my friend with the knowledge, the tools, and the experience uh, took probably 10 minutes. And I was just angry all day. <laughs> but the bottom line is, um, I can fight all day long in my own strength, but every now and then, you need a little help from somebody that has understanding, power, if you will, that can do things a little better. You can try your best all day long to make your changes, but when you tap into the Spirit of God, there is strength beyond what you can muster up on your own. So when you try to do something, we tap into what we already know, and sometimes what we already know doesn't work. Like Lonnie should never become a plumber because I'm not that gifted in plumbing. There are things that I can do, but plumbing, you know what, I'm just gonna stay away, call the experts and let them deal with it. I know the basics, I understand the concept. It's kind of like people that know how to paint. There's people that can paint a wall, and then there's people that just should not even be around a paintbrush. And they understand what they do, but it just doesn't come out that way. Some people can paint a line without any tape. Some people just need tape. They, need, they just need to go get lunch is what <laughs> needs to happen. And there are people like that. And, but they understand that it's not their strength. So here's what God says. God says, I'm going to give you my power to rebuild my temple. You see, there's a difference because we start building stuff and we kind of get caught up in this is what I did. And God says, I'm going to give you my spirit to build my temple. And here we go. Verse seven, nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. In other words, when God calls someone to do something, there's no force on earth and there's no strength in any other person that can stop this. Whenever God gives this, this power, when God calls someone to do something, he gives you the tools, he gives you the plan, he gives you the vision, and he says, I want you to go and I want you to do this, not by your strength, not by your understanding, not by your knowledge, but by my strength, living in you, working in you, growing in you, sharing in you, building in you, together we will do this thing. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the scripture says, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. I love the fact that before the construction starts, God already sees the end. In this scripture, before it even started, God already saw what's going to happen. He said, in the final stone of the temple is in place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. Before you are even attempt to do what God puts on your heart, God knows what the result can be if we surrender to the power of the Spirit. Here's what he says in verse 8. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of, his, of this temple, and he will complete it. And if you pause there for a moment, I did a little research, kind of background of the story. And what I find out is in the initial phase of the construction, it was really kind of awkward it was really kind of a weird place. It, it went really slow. Um, if you read in Ezra, there were times when people visited the early stage of the construction and they actually cried. Now, scholars kind of vary on whether they cried in happiness or whether they cried in sorrow. They cried because, yay, the temple's being built, or they cried in like, this is the temple. <laughs> we, we thought it would be a little bit more. So, uh, we sometimes look at the, these few rocks that were there, and we, we kind of go with, is that all you've got? Is that all there is? And we feel that way, don't we? There are times that we feel this way, and I say this because I have been in these places. You have been in these places, and I'll, and I'll come back to this. Here's a story about, uh, let's go to the gym. How many times have we been to a gym, and you're on a treadmill, and you're thinking, I've got to lose all this weight, I've got to get into shape. I've only lost one pound this week. I don't feel like doing anything. I just kind of hear, and there's no way that I'm going to get to this. I've got to make all these changes. I, I try so hard. I go three days and I fall back. 
I go into the gym and I start working out and I start doing this stuff and I start gaining this momentum and then all of a sudden, um, ice cream. Because <laughs> I don't know who turns down ice cream with chocolate sauce. I just don't know who does that. But we have this big dinner and so we're, we get so embarrassed by the small beginnings because we compare ourselves to the person that's over here running a marathon and we're barely on level one and we're winded and we're like, I can't even do this. And they're over there just no problem at all. And the person over here is doing these crazy things on a, on a treadmill and you're like, whatever. And you look over and there's stairs and there's all of this stuff and there's like, there's no way I can get this. And so in the beginning of everything we do, we look at the mountain and we always say, I will never be this or I will never be that. We look at what is in front of us. I remember training for a half marathon a few years back and I remember going, there's no way that I will be able to do this. There's no way. We were kind of tricked into it. We thought it was a, um, we thought it was a 10K. Little did we know that it was a half marathon. But once we understood that this is what it was, that the training started and, and I started talking to people about how you train for this and, and how we do this and, and they were, here's what they said. It's one step at a time. One step more today than you did yesterday and you make a great increase. So what they told me is one degree. One degree. And you do one degree today and it'll change completely. And so verse 10 says this. Do not despise the small beginnings. I hope this encourages you. I hope this is encouraging to you. Do not despise the small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. He rejoices to see the work begin. And he knows that there's a trial. He knows that there's a struggle. He knows there's a lot of ways that we can go. But he loves to see the work begin according to Zechariah chapter 4. To see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand, you've got to put one stone before you put the second stone. You've got to put the, the, the line down before you put the wood down. You've got to put all of these things. You've got to start. So God rejoices to see the faithful in the one degree. He loves the fact that we look at the Bible and we go, you know, I'm supposed to be reading this, but right now I don't even know where to read. And so I'm just going to, here we are in Proverbs. Now, I don't recommend that. There are ways that you can, you can do. And if you have problems with that, I would love for you to contact me. I can put you on a reading plan. But to know that there are people looking into Scripture, maybe for the first time in a long time, and they're trying to understand what the Scripture really does say, and they're trying to get back to what is going on. Wow. One of the challenges is we look at people and we see their highlight reels we know is behind the scenes we get so intimidated we know what we've done and we see their accomplishments but we don't know I, I saw something this week that just blew my mind my wife and I watched uh, a documentary sports documentary on Alex Smith it's very grotesque um, Alex Smith the football player he, he broke his leg and infection set in and they, they they got so bad they started talking about amputation and they start talking about if we don't, you'll lose your life. And it's just a crazy, crazy thing. But then you fast forward and how he worked through it and how he's ready to make a football comeback. And I'm just, what? What? What is happening? But I see the highlight reels of this is his final product and everything that he went through and we're thinking I'm such a loser I'm such a slacker but the truth of the matter is when we start doing something we start working and we get that one degree and next thing you know we start following that one degree and we just put one foot in front of the other and we start doing something that God wants us to do and we start leading to what God wants us to be and we start growing towards what God expects out of us and then we start leaning in that direction and the next thing you know behind us is what used to be and people are asking you the question what is going on so look at David he was a man after God's own heart he took down Goliath and I want to take down a giant I want to be a guy that knows how to take down a giant but we forget that he was faithful in the years prior to that tending sheep 
And whenever a wild animal would come up, he would run off the animal or he would kill the animal. What was happening? He was learning to be faithful with the small things so God could trust him with the big things. We look at Daniel in the Bible and we're like, wow, he's got such great faith. I mean, he's standing in the lion's den and his faith is unwavering and I want to fight like that. We forget that three times a day, year after year, you know what Daniel did? He stopped whatever he was doing. He knelt down three times a day and he sought the Lord in prayer. You see, that's what he had to do. And we forget about that. So what kind of faith do you think you would have if you devoted three specific times a day, every day, to seek after God? What do you think would happen in your life if that happened? It's the things that no one sees that results in what everybody wants. I read a book. It's Wooden on Leadership. It's about John Wooden, one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. And if you don't know anything about him, he coached UCLA to 10 national titles seven consecutive titles at one time uh, from 67 to 73 and he, he was always this consummate leader and people would look to him for leadership ideas and thoughts and so his first practice every year he, he brought the players over sprints or, or throw free throws or passing the very first thing he did was he would set them down and he would teach them how to put on their socks and shoes and we laugh because we joke. But what he realized is, whenever you lace up socks and shoes, people do it to just put on the socks and shoes and they don't do it correctly. And what was happening? Through the running and through the sprints, they were developing blisters. Other teams were developing blisters and they were running through it. He taught them the correct way to do it and his team did not have blisters. It's the little things that he paid attention to. Why? Because if I can get my, my people to see the small things, then down the road, they're going to be better. And what was the result? Ten national titles. Seven consecutive. Unheard of. Why? Because he paid attention to the one degree. The one degree. Nobody ever thinks about that. It's the little things that are vital. The little things that make big things happen is what he says in his book. It's so often the small things that no one sees that result into the big things that everyone wants. So what's going to happen in the coming weeks? Well, I already told you about what we're going to do with Mother's Day. We're going to talk about <clears throat> changing our words, using our words correctly. We're going to talk about our thoughts because a person thinks so he becomes. You want to change your life one degree? Change your thoughts. And we're going to talk about the words that we use. You want to change the way that you live? Change your thought process, the way you see things, and the words that you use. And then we're going to talk about our habits. Why? Because what we become, we repeat. Because it's impossible to describe the power of a focused life. Because we're trying to get people to focus a little bit more on Jesus, less on the world, and less on its to-do lists. In fact, if you do a study on the words of one thing in the Bible, you'll actually find a fairly common phrase. If you talk about one degree and the one thing that happens in the Bible, it's really kind of comes up in this one way. So David in the Old Testament, he's known after the man after God's own heart is what the Bible says. Do you know what one thing he wanted above anything else? Here's what it says. The one thing I want, the one thing I desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's it. If your number one thing you desire is to be in God's presence, guess what you could be? A man after God's own heart. He didn't go out to become King David. King David was bestowed upon him because his desire was one thing. One thing alone. Paul in the New Testament was the greatest apostle of all time. And if you remember, he, he had a really hard past. He had a really crazy past. Not only as a non-Christian at first, but then as a Christian. He faced massive persecution. I don't know which was worse, the, the before or after Christ in his life. I don't know. We're talking about a guy who endured some massive pain. And you know what he said? Here's what he said. I, I, it, rather than saying, I'm going to think about my past. It's been really hard. These people are mean to me. Instead of thinking about that, here's what he says. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. One thing I do, 
forgetting what is behind, forgetting my past. I don't let my past dictate my future. I let my past understand that my past is my foundation I build upon. And it may be crappy, it may be horrible, it may be terrible, it may be the worst past ever, but your past does not dictate your future. God has something more, something more for me. So one thing I do is I let go of all of that and I'm moving forward because God has something different, something better, something more. So let's put it this way. One degree equals one thing. One degree equals one thing. When you focus on one thing, it's amazing what God can do. But when you miss your one thing, it's amazing the blessings that you can miss. Have you ever thought about that? How many blessings have you missed because you did not focus on the one thing that God wanted you to do? How many things did you miss because God said and you decided not to? How many things? Let me go back and make this a little personal for me. I'll tell you what kind of haunts me a lot whenever I think about it because I try not to dwell on it, but it's there. What haunts me is when I ran from God's call at the age of 16 and I didn't receive the call and I just turned from God and I did everything else at the age of 16 that a 16 year old would do until I was about 22, 23 when Don and I were married and we went back to church and we started going back and we kind of gave our life to Christ. There's this window that was missed and I keep asking myself, how many people do not know about Jesus to this day because of that small window? And you might go, that's crazy. Well, I mean, that's a crazy thing. No, it's true. You missed the most important thing. Jesus visited the home of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. And Mary was enjoying the presence of Jesus. Martha was winging out. She was trying to get everything ready. The teas look lukewarm. The dishes don't match. The table doesn't set right. The food's not done. The, this is wrong. The, the, the towels don't match. The, the chairs need ruffling. The floor needs vacuuming and all this kind of stuff. I don't know what she's doing, but you can use your imagination. And Jesus looked at her and he said, Martha, you're upset about so many things, but only one thing is needed. You're so upset about so many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary, who was sitting at Jesus' feet, has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Things distracted you, but she is paying attention. Things are going on. This one thing, you're worried about everything being correct and everything being perfect. And there's a, there's a world, I'm telling you, that everything has to be perfect before I can do this thought process. And there's so many people that think that. You've missed the most important thing. I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And God is going, you know what? I've got a blessing for you today in the scripture for 15 minutes. If you would just listen to me, I've got a message for you in the scripture. If you would just listen to me and here's what we go. You know what, God, I, I I'll get to you tomorrow, but I've really got to do. And then we go with our schedule. Luke chapter 18, Jesus encountered a very wealthy, successful young business person. And the guy wanted to follow Jesus. He comes up and he goes, I want to be on your team. How can I be on your team? I want to be a part of it. And the problem was the material possessions were so important to him that he was missing a true blessing of becoming a Christ follower. And so Jesus said, hey, uh, you only lack one thing. Just one thing. Here's what you need to do. I, I'm going to give you the one thing that you need to do so you can come and be a part of my team. And you get this right, you can change the world. The guy says, I'm in. What do I do? Go sell all your possessions and give all that stuff away. Don't let it weigh you down. And then come and follow me. The guy went away sad because he was unwilling to change his life. You don't understand. This means everything to me. This means everything to me. God, I've been working all my life for this and you're telling me I gotta give it away? Yes. Why? Because this has become your idol. You're not worshiping me, you're worshiping this. Your to-do list, your, your job, your home, your sports, your, your, your family, your, what, put whatever you want right here because it's more focused on this than it is on this. So you made a decision to kind of shift this way. And so here you are. How do I come back to you? You've got to shift. So I need you to get rid of the thing that is most important to you. 
Now we kind of think about all of this and we go, well, this is crazy. I have to give up everything. Think about Job. Job lost everything. Job lost everything. His wife even told him, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just, why, I mean, why don't you just get rid of all this stuff? So God took everything from him. But if you read at the end of Job, he got double of everything because he remained faithful. His friends were just telling him, I don't know what you did, but you did something to hack off God. So what I want to do is I want to ask you to seek God for one specific word, a resolution, if you will, a thought process, a word. Don't give me these New Year's resolution type focuses. I want to challenge you to focus as you can. And, and so this is your assignment. It's very doable. One word. God, give me one word that will kind of change my thought process of the day. Don't give me these, these, these resolutions that you go, yeah, I'm going to lose weight. No, you're not. <laughs> because you haven't, you haven't changed your diet. You haven't done anything to add to that. You haven't, you know, if you say I'm going to lose weight and then you, I see your car parked at the gym, I'm going to go, I believe them. But if I see it parked at Dairy Queen, I'm going to go, hmm. We got problems. How committed are you to this? So I want to ask you to seek God for one specific word that will divine, uh, define and then direct your days to come. Now, I, I want to share with you a few things because it kind of... One word. And then you can also put a verse to it. Because it's not going to be by your might or your power, but by God's spirit that he will empower you. So, and you'll not believe how different your life can be when you focus on one God-breathed word that can help direct the decisions of your life. And it's kind of helped me. Now, let me tell you how I've used this in my own life. <clears throat> Last year, I was asking for guidance, and God gave me a word, and it was really kind of a, a cool thing, and we're, we're still working on it. Now, here's the other thing, too. Just because he gave you a word at one, one time doesn't mean you have to work until completion. It's... You work and you keep going and then you understand and as you're going in that direction it's now give me another word and so now I have two words you see it started with one and then it goes to two and, it, and so it's, it's kind of this stair-stepping so what we're doing is we're not we talk about stair-stepping and I go in, we're stair-stepping we're going up we're not going down so here's the word that he gave me and it kind of helped me in my sermon preps, it kind of helped me in, in Bible study. We're not where we need to be, but we're leading towards this. And here's the word. Discipleship. Discipleship. You can get people to attend a worship service, but if they don't become deeper in Christ, it's simply a gathering. And that's been weighing heavy on my mind. Just because there's a crowd doesn't mean they're going deeper in their faith. And notice, I, even in myself... We had a lot of very young Christians that were getting tripped up because between religion and relationships because when it comes to Christ, here's what the scripture says. When it comes to Christ, John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32, and this is the scripture. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This was my scripture that I kind of looked at and went, everything I do must be towards discipleship. It's got to lead towards discipleship. But the first thing I had to do was listen. I had to understand where the people were and we're starting to look. Now, if you start listening to my teachings and you start listening to how this is being directed, you can go, okay, I get it. And if you look back at the messages I preached last year, they were prayerfully designed to strengthen the church through discipleship. Kind of come together. It's amazing what God can do when you focus on a very direct one word. One word. And that's what it was. And so my, my personal word for, for this year, it's not a church word, but my personal word, if you've been listening to me in the past couple of weeks, you already know it. And here's the word that I, I've already required. Discipleship required. And here's my scripture. Go in the Old Testament, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Here we go. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does he require of you? And if you want to, you can put your name in there. So I put my name in there. Read it this way. And what does the, requ the Lord require of you, Lonnie? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly in your faith. 
To walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with Jesus. To walk this way. Because see, it, it becomes so easy for us to say, this is what I am doing. Remember the beginning, in Zer- it, it, we were talking about in Zechariah. Not by my strength, nor by my power, but by God's strength and by God's power. So how do we do this? This is how we can... So I wonder what I can accomplish by asking God, what do you require of me? The prayers that I pray is, Lord, what do you require of me? Not what shall you have me do today, and I put it on an agenda, but this is what I require of you. In other words, this is a direct quote, and God says, this is what I want you to do. Now I have direct purpose. I have optimism. I have marching orders each and every day. And when you ask God, what is my requirement? It's not a checkbox. It's a life check. It's a new direction, because asking God what is required, it removes my plan. My plan. This is what I had planned for today. This is what my daily schedule is going to look like. This is what I'm going to do today. And God says, I require that you go and do. You see, it's a one degree. And now instead of the struggle, I can just go, I'm just going to follow what God wants me to do. Suddenly you've got some spiritual momentum and you've got this word. Then you take your word and I don't know what it is. Faith, focus, be healing, discernment, whatever it is. And then you, and I'm going to, then I want you to go online and Google that word for Bibles and verses. Because it's, it's easy for us to go, well, how do I find? And if you have a concordance in the back of your Bible, like I do, there's words in there and you can, you can do that and you can do that however you want to. Or maybe God's going to give you this word and you go, you know what? This is my scripture and it fits perfectly. And that's great. Then go with it. But if you have no clue and God gives you a word, you know, focus, healing, discernment, whatever it could be, generosity, serving. Well, then go Google that and go serving scriptures. And something's going to pop out at you. And here's what I want you to do. Don't just take that scripture and go, this is my scripture. I want you to take that scripture and I want you to read the entire chapter. Read the entire chapter and just go, what is happening in the Bible that God says, this is what I require of you? Or this is what serving looks like. And suddenly when you wake up, there's a verse, there's a word. That's focusing on you. And here's what I want you to do. Put it in different places. If you have to, write it on the mirror in the bathroom. We've got a big, huge mirror in our bathroom. Write it on the mirror in your bathroom. Write it on on the refrigerator. Put it somewhere where you see it all the time. And it reminds you every day, whenever you come home from work, when you go to work, when you get up in the morning, whenever you're making dinner, whenever you're doing whatever, and, and you can see it and you go, you know what, I'm reminded. Discipline. That's your word. And suddenly you're disciplined. And you're making wise choices. And you're going, you know what? That's, I shouldn't be doing that. Extra. Maybe that's your word. Extra. And, and people are going, I noticed you give a little extra whenever you do that. Why is that? Because that's the word that God gave me. I need to go and do a little bit more. Details. And we talked about John Wooden and the details. Maybe it's the details. I need to pay attention to the details because I'm so spread out. And it's kind of like, <clears throat> it's kind of like taking a shotgun to a target practice. You, you, you hit the bullseye, but you hit everything else around it too. But you don't really hit the bullseye. And so maybe it's, it's details. Maybe I need to pay attention to the details. Maybe I need to wake up a little bit more. Maybe I need to, to get up earlier. Maybe I need to be on time for this. Maybe I need to do whatever. Maybe it's relationship. And, and you're sitting there serving people in relationships. Maybe it's something that you have to build. Maybe you're not a good people person. Maybe God is talking to you and going, you know what? You need to be more relational because you have so many gifts that are inside of you and when we start doing that one degree and they're going to come out people are going to want to be with you and at the end of maybe six months or 12 months or or however long someone's going to come up to you and go what's up with you (laughs) I, i i i don't get it i mean i don't mean to be rude but you really weren't in good shape last year you were you were now you're you're good not only good you're you're a whole lot better than you were when you even were not in good shape. So what happened? Wow, one degree. Maybe you're, you're talking about, you know what? My marriage is on the rocks. You weren't even that close to God and now, what happened? What's the big thing? And you're saying, you know what? I've got to be honest with you. It wasn't anything really big. It was something really small. 
you know, something that God put in front of me, and I just decided to be faithful in the small things. And I decided to be one degree. Because you know what God loves? God loves when you're faithful in small things. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the small things. And guess what? You are now promotable. Now I can trust you with even bigger things. You've done amazing with this. And God says, I want to not just take you in your leadership or take you to something better. I want to take you as a person to a whole nother level. And you're ready. You're ready. And when people look and wonder why your life is so different, they can't even fathom it. You just say, you know what? One degree equals one thing. It's one degree. Because when you focus on one thing, it's amazing what God can accomplish through you. Don't let anybody fool you. It's not the big things. It's made up of faithfulness in small things over time. It's often the small things that no one ever sees that results into the big things that everybody wants. And it's an amazing thing. So I would encourage you today. I have, you have your marching orders. And I would love to hear from you. I would love for you to maybe post it on our, our Facebook page or, or maybe Instagram or, or even to YouTube. Just post it out and go, here's my word. Boom. Here's what God gave to me. Boom. And, and we're, living in, uh, we're living in Oregon or we're in Colorado or we're in South Carolina or we're in California or we're in Alaska. And this is what the word that God gave me. And, and we're just going to go faithful with that. And, and I would be encouraged because now we have something to pray for you. As a church, you may not ever be able to come into the walls of this church. But because you're listening to us, you're a part of our church family, and we want to grow together. And now what we have is we have Joe Q. Public that is from Vermont, and here's my word, rest. And so we can pray that way, and we want to be encouraging to you, and we want to make sure that God is doing amazing things in your life. And so I would encourage you just right now, just start sharing that. Maybe God has given it to you, or maybe you need to pray about that. Maybe you've already got a word. Maybe you've already done it. But just remember, one word equals one degree, and it's one thing, and it can be a big, huge change. Let's pray. Father God, we are blessed beyond belief. Thank you, God, so much for the encouragement. Thank you for the direction. Thank you for the guidance. Thank you for the leadership. God, thank you for the word that you have given us. And God, as we are worshiping together today, speak to us in a unique way. Every person that clicks on this post, may they hear your voice. May it be undeniably your voice. And may they just be so awestruck that they decide, God, I need you to direct me one degree. Father, we are expecting great things. And we believe great things are going to happen. So, Father, be with us, encourage us, and love us. We ask this in your name. Amen. We're going to celebrate. we got one more song. Don't go anywhere. Here's what I would require of you. <laughs> is that you just sing it at the top of your lungs. That This is a beautiful song. We've sung it so many times. And it just don't, don't turn us off. Just sing this. Turn up the volume on whatever you're looking at, your phone or your tablet or your TV or your computer, whatever it is. And let's have a great time of praise as we sing this song. I don't know. 
We are so glad that you joined us today, and I'm super excited to hear from you and know that God is going to do some great things. This week, there's going to be a, a bunch of videos coming out about what we're going to do in the services and, and uh, the future of the church and how you can join in Bible studies and all that stuff. So keep an ear out and an eye out for all of that. Thank you so much for joining us. Wherever you are, just give us a big shout out. We look forward to your word. And I hope you have an amazing day. And the blessings that you get today will just encourage you to continue to dig into God's word. And we will see you next week. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Thank you.